Okay. Um, this is like homecoming. Uh, I recognize so many faces here. And um, I, I do want to make special mention um, that my co-editor, Dan Holt, and his wife, Marilyn Holt, drove in from Kansas for this. And uh, our assistant editors, um, Mame Warren, um, and, uh, and I just did it. I keep forgetting. Anne, what's your last name? Wells. Wells. <laughs> this is, you know, uh, we, I, I, I think there are a lot of people in this audience who understand that crazy <laughs> short. I forgot who I had lunch with yesterday. It was, it's been crazy. Okay, let's get going here. Um, on October 30th, 1953, General of the Army, George C. Marshall, received word that he had been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. In keeping with tradition, the Nobel Institute provided no explanation for giving the award or for selecting, for the first time, a professional soldier. Now, most commentators assumed Marshall had received the prize for the European Recovery Program, better known as the Marshall Plan. He had proposed this in 1947. He had done so much to get it through Congress when he was the Secretary of State in 1947 and 1948. It was nearly, I, everything I've read said, okay, it is the Marshall Plan, it's the Marshall Plan, except, uh, and credit to Mame Warren for having found this, except for George Marshall. When he was interviewed, when he had a press conference, uh, right after the announcement. He said, according to the New York Times, that, quote, his greatest contribution to world peace, co contributions to world peace, were in speeding United States preparations to fight aggression in 1940, when he was Army Chief of Staff, and, quote, again in 1950 as the Secretary of Defense. Truly, George Marshall was defining himself as a soldier of peace. Now, I have been asked uh, th this afternoon to explore Marshall as a soldier of peace during the time period of the two world wars and in light of the numerous presentations many of you have heard uh, since January in the Foundation's Legacy series. I'm just curious, how many of you have heard at least one or two of those lectures? Oh, great, okay, all right. So when I mention certain people, you're gonna know who I am talking about. Okay, now, what I would like to point out is that, um, and emphasize, is that interestingly, Marshall in his 1953 statement as to what his contributions to world peace were, was equating peace with military preparedness. And it's a theme that I'm going to go into here. This is no accident. Three times in his professional life, he had witnessed the United States plunge into war militarily unprepared. 1917, 1941, and 1950. And each time, it was, he, it was Marshall who had been asked to help create and train a new army. As a result of these experiences, Marshall had come to believe that proper military preparedness either could have, av uh, excuse me, could have averted war entirely or seriously diminished both the duration of the war and the number of American soldiers and sailors who died. And throughout the post-World War II years, Marshall would consequently and forcefully call, unsuccessfully, for the creation of a universal military training system to keep the nation prepared in the uh, future. Let me clarify here, I am not talking about universal military service, a draft. That is not the same thing. And as I get into it, I will explain there's a big difference between drafting uh, a person at 18 and keeping them in active service for at least two years and taking them for six months and training them and then bringing them back for more training and bringing them up only when you absolutely need them. But let me hold that. Okay, 
World War I was Marshall's first experience with U.S. military unpreparedness in wartime. At that point, he was a captain, and he was an aide to the then hospitalized General J. Franklin Bell. In effect, because of this, Marshall was put in charge of mobilization in Bell's Eastern Department. Marshall was soon shifted to the staff of the 1st Division as head of its operations, or G3 section, and he was sent to France, where on June 22nd, he followed the division commander, General William Seibert, as the first Americans to go ashore from the first convoy of US troops. But the 1st Division was a division in name only. Paul Barron pointed this out, and he was absolutely Correct. There were no divisions in 1917. The first division, quote unquote, had hastily been put together from understrength regiments and recent recruits and sent to France to bolster Allied morale in the face of continued military failures and massive casualties along the Western Front. Many of the soldiers in the 1st Division had only received their rifles before boarding the ship in New York City. Newly organized howitzer, mortar, and 37 millimeter cannon units had no such weapons, or in Forrest Pogue's famous words, they had not even heard of those weapons. They had no training in trench warfare, or indeed in any basic military behavior. In an episode that Marshall would remember for the rest of his life, and one he often repeated to others, appalled and humiliated, he watched as a disheveled U.S. sentry responded to a questioning from a French general about his rifle by handing the weapon over to the French general and then sitting down on a windowsill to roll a cigarette. <laughs> And Marshall, as a result, spent much of his time during the summer and fall of 1917 involved in the training of the men of the first D, uh, of this division. When General John J. Pershing, commander of the entire American Expeditionary Force in France, visited First Division headquarters, he was not impressed. A good reason. There was nothing to be impressed about. And during an October 3rd visit, he publicly blamed General Seibert and thus humiliated him in front of his uh, other officers for the problems that he saw. This led to the first of two eventful confrontations for the then still very hot-tempered marshal in France. The first one with Pershing. At that time, Marshall was the acting divisional chief of staff with the temporary rank of major. He sprang to Seibert's defense, and as Paul noted in his lecture, when Pershing tried to ignore him and depart, Marshall put his hand on Pershing's arm to prevent him from leaving, and as Marshall himself said, I practically forced him to talk, or more accurately, to listen. When Marshall got angry, it was a torrent of facts and words that would come out. And Marshall cited fact after fact to show that the fault did not lie with Seibert, but instead with Pershing's own general headquarters. Uh, the exchange was incredible. Uh, and Pershing finally broke away. And as Marshall said, everyone said it was a shame that my stay in France was going to be so brief. <laughs> it was not brief, we'll get back to that. The second confrontation occurred a month later in the aftermath of the first American combat deaths that were the result of a German raid on the U.S. position. This confrontation was with a French general, General Paul Bordeaux, who as Ed Lengel pointed out in his uh, talk here, Bordeaux questioned whether the American troops had, quote, showed fight during the episode. Enraged. Marshall thereupon attacked Bordeaux to his face for not allowing prior American reconnaissance of the site beyond the wire as had been re requested by U.S. Uh, officials. And Marshall threatened to take the entire matter to Bordeaux's superior as well as General Seibert. <laughs> 
Now, the matter was eventually papered over by Bordeaux's arrangement of a very moving ceremony to commemorate the three dead U.S. soldiers. Soldiers whose names Marshall would remember more than 30 years later. Corporal Hay, Private Enright, Private Gresham. He also recalled the ceremony itself. And these recollections came when in 1948, when Marshall was in France, Bordeaux wrote to him as the Secretary of State and said, do you remember? And Marshall said, I remember very well, and then cited the three names. Now this confrontation was one of many that Pershing, as well as Marshall, would have with US allies. And it may very well have taught Marshall the lesson Winston Churchill would later verbalize, that the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without them. <laughs> Ed Langle pointed out in his presentation, American officers from Pershing on down believed that the three-year stalemate and bloodbath in the trenches had resulted from a traditional European lack of innovation and creativity a lack of innovation and creativity that could contaminate the Americans if they allowed their forces to be amalgamated into French and British lines. Helping Pershing avoid this was the fact that the only order that President Woodrow Wilson gave Pershing was keep the American army separate. The reason? So he could have bargaining position at the Paris Peace Conference. Um, but as we can see, Pershing and his officers had other reasons. They didn't want to be poisoned, if you will, by what they considered the wrong British and French uh, methods. They had mixed success here. The American Expeditionary Force remained a separate force although at times, in case of emergency, it was used with the British and the French forces. The Americans overall were trained in an American way of war that emphasized flexibility and creativity and open warfare rather than trench warfare. Uh, one might quip, it's lucky the Americans came in in 1917 and really didn't send major forces in until 1918 when the trench warfare began to open up into open warfare. Uh, so the Americans left the war saying, we were right. It, 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 it's open warfare that works. Despite the problems with the Allies, Marshall also learned the importance uh, of them. World War I, I would remind you, was the first American experience with allies since the 1778 alliance with France during the War for Independence. And that alliance with France had left a bad taste in many American mouths before it ended in 1800. That end was preceded by an undeclared naval war with the ally France. Uh, it, it was not a happy marriage uh, once the American War for Independence ended. With French officers uh, on an almost daily basis, and he clearly learned the vital importance of having allies in any future war, as well as the problems you would have working with allies. The previous confrontation with Pershing had enormous consequences for Marshall. Rather than relieving him for insubordination, Pershing came to rely upon Marshall when he visited, for, whenever he visited First Division headquarters. And in the summer of 1918, Pershing had Marshall transferred to the operations division of his general headquarters st staff. Here, Marshall would serve under the then Colonel, later General, Fox Connor. And he soon developed a reputation for his planning of the U.S. offensive operations at San Miguel and in the Meuse are gone. Um, what he did, and, and, and you know, if I had the time, I would go into this in greater depth. But he is moving hundreds of thousands of American troops into the line and French troops out of the line with their equipment secretly at night with only three rail lines and I think two roads to do it. He developed 
a nickname at this time, Wizard, uh, for his ability to do all of this. Now these offensives had to be, of course, carefully coordinated with the Allies. So Marshall was once again working with them and learning how vital they were to victory. The American successes, especially in the Meuse-Argonne, would not have happened without the French and British forces to their left and to an extent to their right at this time. Uh, but Marshall also learned the inevitable problems that arose when one had allies and the need to address these problems. I would argue that Marshall's World War II insistence on the creation of the Anglo-American Combined Chiefs of Staff and the principle of unity of command, then World War II in every theater, all British and US Army, Navy, and Air Forces were to be under a single commander from one of the two countries. Uh, that all of this could be traced back to the fact that this did not exist during World War I and the Allies suffered for it. There were numerous reasons for the lack of Allied unity during World War I. In a 1940 War College lecture, Marshall's wartime superior and friend, Fox Connor, warned that, quote, dealing with the enemy is, simple and and is a simple and straightforward matter when contrasted with securing close cooperation with an ally. And Connor then explained at the War College why achieving unity of command with allies was so, um, excuse me, why it was so difficult to achieve this. Uh, and I would love to read it, but that would take so much time to be the end of the lecture and I'm still in World War I. So if you ask me during the Q&A, uh, I can give you some of Connor's reasons and they are so incisive. He is the missing link in any study of 20th century US Army history. Um, because um, in the 1920s, Connor would tell his then young protege, the unknown Dwight Eisenhower, to get an assignment with Marshall if at all possible. Why? Because in the future, and this is Eisenhower quoting Connor, we will have to fight beside allies and George Marshall knows more about the techniques of arranging allied commands than any man I know. He is nothing short of a genius. Um, unfortunately, Connor destroyed his papers. So historians you know, have to work around to figure out uh, uh, what his impact was. Back to Pershing. Pershing clearly recognized Marshall's genius and after the armistice in 1918, he sought to retain Marshall in any capacity he could. He gave Marshall a host of specific assignments and then in April of 1919, Pershing made Marshall one of his aides. Now again, going back to what Paul Barron noted, Marshall was much more than an aide, and a very strong bond developed between Pershing and Marshall. I'll go into that in a little bit greater depth in a couple of uh, moments. But I'll just note that Marshall went with Pershing to Washington and stayed with Pershing in Washington during his appointment and tenure as the Army Chief of Staff. And in Washington, Marshall would become deeply involved in highly political as well as military matters concerning the future of the United States Army. And he became a strong supporter of the idea of universal military training as it was proposed at this time by his old friend, John McCauley Palmer. Congress in 1919 was debating what the post-war army should look like. A key lesson from the World War I experience had been the lack of U.S. preparedness for war. In effect, the United States declared war in April of 1917. First Division was sent, but that was it. Troops trained did not really begin to arrive until a year later. And even when those trained troops were put into battle, they had to rely upon their allies for key um, artillery, shells, 
other material. Now, the Army Chief of Staff in 1919, General Peyton C. Marsh, argued for a 500% increase in the size of the pre-war army, from 100,000 to 500,000, capable of further expansion in the event of war and a draft. Palmer, supported by Pershing, argued that the nation could not afford such a large permanent force without a dangerously unbalanced budget and higher taxes. And that what March was proposing was, quote, not in harmony with the genius of American institutions. Instead, he and Pershing proposed an army of 275,000 to 300,000 that would be designed to train the National Guard and a huge reserve force that would come out of universal military training so that the nation could be military, militarily prepared for any future crisis. Now, in a sense, what Palmer and Pershing and Marshall are doing here is reviving the old and failed colonial militia system. But they're saying the reason it had failed was the lack of proper training, the lack of any central control. The militia system, supposedly, every able-bodied male was part of the system and was supposed to be trained. The training days, however, just turned into social events. They were not trained. The few units that did seriously train would eventually become the National Guard. And what, what you have here is, let's train all, and at this point they're talking only about men, let us train all able-bodied men, use the small professional army to train them. Marshall and Palmer both saw a universal military training, which I'll henceforth call UMT, as the only democratic and affordable solution to the need for military preparedness in the 20th century, given the lessons of World War I. Well, in 1920, Congress agreed to an army of just under 300,000, as they had called for, but they did not agree to UMT that was to be the core of this army. Further cuts followed, and by the time Marshall became the Chief of Staff in 1939, the Army was down to 175,000 and was woefully unprepared for war. Now what happened in 1919 and 1920 was but one of Marshall's many experiences with Congress while he was an aide to Pershing. Experiences, I would argue, that clearly prepared him for his tenure as Chief of Staff during World War II. And during that tenure, he would establish an utterly extraordinary relationship with Congress. I'll deal with that in a few moments. But beyond that, right now what I'd like to go back to for a moment is the relationship with Pershing. Paul told you that Marshall became Pershing's confidant. I'd add more. Um, he was, in effect, Pershing's executive officer and virtual deputy chief of staff when Pershing was not around. He was also Pershing's protege, and perhaps even more than that. Pershing became Marshall's mentor, and in many ways a key father figure. Now, I am not a psychiatrist, and I don't want to carry this too far. But Marshall came out of a family where his father was very distant, okay, and there was not a strong relationship with the father. Here is your father figure, if you want that. Pershing had lost his wife and three of his four children in a fire uh, be, before the war. And he is, in effect, looking, if you will, for a son. Um, I think the most gut-wrenching correspondence uh, I ever read in the Marshall Papers came when uh, Marshall's first wife died. Um, and Pershing wrote to him saying, nobody knows better than I do what you are going through now. Uh, and Marshall's response, which I have brilliantly managed to lose amidst all these papers, uh, I will get back to it, for one of the few times he opens up 
Um, and he says, I am at a loss. Uh, this Marshall's whole emotional life was with his wife, both his first wife and his second wife. And he says, if I had been used to the um, uh, company of men and anything beyond basic army work, uh, if I had socialized more, it would be easier. Uh, I don't know how I am going to get along. Here it is. I found it. Stalled in time. And I, and, and I found it. Pershing said, my heart goes out to you at this crisis in your life. One week later, Marshall responded that the thought of what Pershing had endured in 1915 had given him uh, hope. Nevertheless, he admitted, 26 years of most intimate companionship, something I have known ever since I was a mere boy, leaves me lost in my best efforts to adjust myself to future prospects in life. If I had been given to club life or other intimacies with men outside of athletic diversions, or if there was a campaign or another pressing duty demanding a concentrated effort, then I think I could do better. He didn't have any of that. He concluded that somehow he would get along. Um, and of course, he did. Uh, let me also point out that when Marshall did meet his second wife um, and remarry, Pershing was his best man. Uh, and <laughs> saying was more people came to see Pershing than, than came <laughs> for the wedding. Those of you who are interested, uh, Marshall's second wife, Catherine, wrote a memoir that Marshall went over very carefully before it went to press and her description of what went on at that wedding and her introduction to army life will have you on the floor. <laughs> now, by the time he met and married Catherine Marshall, who was a widow, he was in the fourth year of his assignment as the assistant commandant of the infantry school at Fort Benning. This assignment restored his spirit and had profound consequences for the World War II Army. Marshall restructured the curriculum of this school so as to emphasize what he had learned in World War I, as well as from his previous experiences at Fort Leavenworth and with the National Guard. What? The need for simplicity in plans and orders. The ability to innovate and deal with the unexpected. And to encourage that, Marshall banned written lectures. He also provided poor maps or no maps so as to duplicate the confusion on the battlefield. And he emphasized the need for thoughtful and original responses to the unexpected. And of course, he emphasized training in a warfare of movement. The old American belief in this regard had been reinforced by the experience of World War I and the revolution in warfare that was then taking place, caused primarily by the development of the internal combustion engine. And just stop and think of what the internal combustion engine leads to. The truck, the tank, the armored personnel carrier, the airplane, the Jeep eventually, uh, you can just go on and on. Now, Dick Daso, when he gave his lecture on Hap Arnold, pointed out that, Hap, that Marshall and Hap Arnold, the head of the Army Air Forces during World War II, became friends early on when they and their wives lived near each other during Marshall's second tour of duty in the Philippines, 1913 to 1916. Indeed, Arnold at that time was watching Marshall during a, a, uh, uh, a war game give orders in the field. He's sitting under a bamboo clump. And he came home and said to his wife, I have just seen a, an army chief of staff for the future, just watching Marshall work. Arnold became chief of the Army Air Corps. There was no separate Air Force until 1947. He became chief of the Army Air Corps in 1938. That's the same year Marshall was called to Washington to serve first as the head of the War Plans Division and then as the deputy chief of staff. 
The result of Marshall's work at Benning before this was the so-called spirit of Benning and the virtual creation of the American World War II military character. Simplicity, innovation, mobility were the hallmarks of the U.S. Army at this time. Marshall also, in effect, created, virtually created the American World War II High Command at Benning. 200 future World War II generals were at Benning during the years Marshall was there. 150 as students, 50 as instructors, including such names as Bradley and uh, Bradley and Stillwell. Now, Stephen Taffy's lecture here, where he pointed out Marshall had four criteria for high command in World War II. Character, military education, youth, and his personal knowledge of you. Give it, there, there is just no accident that 200 of the generals came out of these years at Benning. After Benning, he had a series of postings that involved him deeply with civilians. Uh, Forts Screven and Moultrie, the Illinois National Guard, Vancouver Barracks, and most importantly, work with the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was a New Deal program to take urban unemployed youth and put them to work in the reforesting rural areas um, and other work in the outdoors. Now, these were not members of the army. They were civilians, but they were directed by the army. And in effect, what Marshall had here were the citizen soldiers he wanted in a universal military training system, and he loved the CCC. He absolutely loved the outdoor work with them, and the fact that he had to convince these boys to work with him and listen to what he had to say. In 1938, Marshall is recalled to Washington, and as I said, first made head of the War Plans Division, and then Deputy Chief of Staff. As Deputy Chief of Staff, he had a notorious confrontation with Franklin Roosevelt that Paul talked about. Talking back to Roosevelt um, at a meeting, saying, frankly, Mr. President, I don't agree with that at all. Uh, that ended the meeting. Everyone shook Marshall's hand, saying it's a shame his stay in Washington was going to be so brief. But the reverse happened, as it had with Pershing. Instead of relieving Marshall, Roosevelt jumped 33 senior officers to appoint him the next chief of staff. Uh, I, I'd like to emphasize here for just a minute the importance, as exhibited by both Pershing and Roosevelt, of a superior welcoming dissent uh, from this, this officer. They want to hear the disagreement. It will help them. That doesn't mean they're going to follow what Marshall says, but they want to hear what he has to say. And uh, as has been pointed out, Marshall's chief of staff makes clear his disagreements with Roosevelt, but when Roosevelt says, this is it, I am the commander in chief, it is yes, sir. I will, I will do it. Um, Marshall's second major bout with unpreparedness was when the war began in Europe. And it began in Europe, Hitler invaded Poland on the same day Marshall was to be sworn in as army chief of staff. Uh, he was woken up at three in the morning to tell him that uh, the German army had moved uh, across the border. He is sworn in a few hours later. Now, most of us who have studied Marshall agree that 1939 to 1941 were the most difficult years he had as Army Chief of Staff. Why? Somehow, he must prepare for the possibility of war without alienating those in the Congress and the country, and they are quite, there are a large number of them, who are opposed to intervention in the war. They used to be called isolationists. I don't like the term. I don't think the United States was ever 
isolationist, but that's another matter that we can talk about. I prefer the term, and um, the, the scholars of the isolationist movement are using it more and more, anti-interventionist. They're in Congress, they're in the public, and they're in his own war department. Indeed, uh, there is a feud in the war department between the Secretary of War, Woodring, who is an anti-interventionist, and the Assistant Secretary of War, Louis Johnson, who is an interventionist. And that creates absolute hell for Marshall's predecessor as Chief of Staff and for Marshall. Marshall must also deal with the President, who prefers naval and air expansion and material support for Britain and France over the expansion of the Army. Okay? Uh, there are numerous reasons for this. Um, one is a political reason. Roosevelt said it perfectly. American mothers don't want their boys to become soldiers, but they don't seem to mind them becoming sailors. Uh, Roosevelt himself is a Navy man, former Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and at one point Marshall had to say to him, please Mr. President, it would be helpful if you would cease referring to the Navy as we and the Army as they in the discussions <laughs> that, that we have. In May-June, France collapsed in six weeks. And this came as a great shock to the American people. And suddenly there was great support for military preparedness. You have the first peacetime draft in US history and a massive expansion of the army from 175,000 up to 1.4 million by December of 1941. Also, Roosevelt gets rid of Woodring and Johnson and brings in the Republican interventionist, Henry Stimson to run the War Department. Stimson had been secretary, the Republican Secretary of War under William Howard Taft and then Secretary of State under Herbert Hoover. And he does the same thing in the Navy Department. He brings a Republican internationalist in. Actually, the man who ran against him for the Vice Presidency in 1936, Frank Knox. It's not, it's the closest America ever comes to the idea of a um, bipartisan war cabinet. Um, the British know how to do that. Uh, this, this is mild, but it is key. Marshall, despite all of this, must still avoid involvement in taking sides in this interventionist, anti-interventionist debate. He talks about military preparedness for defense if the United States is attacked and as a way to deter potential enemies from attacking. Yet, it is also during this time period that U.S. Army and Navy planners, led by the Chief of Naval Operations, Harold Stark, decide that if the United States finds itself aligned with Great Britain and at war with the Axis powers, it should focus on defeating Germany first in alliance with Great Britain. The historian Louis Morton correctly called this the most important strategic decision of World War II for this country. Roosevelt informally agrees to it, and secret conversations take place between American and British off officers in the early months of 1941. Throughout the rest of 1941, Marshall develops an extraordinary relationship with Congress and the American people. Um, there are numerous reasons for this. He is politically astute. He has learned from his past experiences and he knows he must maintain good relations with Congress, and he does. Uh, one of the congressional leaders said he never lied to us. He would tell us the truth even when it hurt his cause. He turns down funds that are offered to him that he didn't ask for. And in retirement, when he is asked to um, comment on one of the uh, 80 volumes in the U.S. Army in World War II series, the Chief of Staff volume, which he approved of highly, he wrote that um, he turned down the extra funds for two reasons, one military, one political. 
The military reason was that he did not have enough trained uh, non-commissioned officers to expand the army faster than he was. And it was useless to expand the army if it was not a well-trained army. And you needed those sergeants in order to be able to do it. Second reason was political. Republicans were furious over this. In 1940 was a presidential election year. Why alienate them? As he put it, I realized I would need their votes in the future far more than I needed this extra money now. And in, in that sort of logic, you can see Marshall had an uncanny ability to take the long view, to see around the corner and not get bogged down by what was directly in front of him. Episode after episode where he um, did this. So he gets this, this great relationship with Congress. Relations with Roosevelt at this point are not as good because Roosevelt does not want a massive expansion of U.S. ground forces. What he wants to do, he gets the Lend-Lease Bill passed, let's give aid to Britain and to the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union is attacked, and we'll build up naval and air. And Marshall is saying, excuse me, you can't give those planes and tanks to Britain and Russia, we need them for our army. And Roosevelt is saying, no, they're going to go there. When does Roosevelt accept the fact that the United States is going to be a full-scale belligerent in this war? Historians argue over this. I don't think he did until December 7th, 1941. That before then, he's juggling and he's figured, if I send enough Lend-Lease supplies, maybe the British and Russians can do it on their own. I am willing to have an undeclared naval war in order to get the supplies to Great Britain and Russia. But he, very little support for a massive expansion of the army until the United States is fully in the war. And then things change. Once the United States is in the war, Marshall is determined that this war shall not repeat the World War I experience in regard to preparedness and in regard to allied coordination. Thus, not only the efforts I've talked about, but also immediately after Pearl Harbor, Churchill writes to Roosevelt saying, I'm coming to Washington. Probably the last thing in the world that Franklin Roosevelt needed at that point. Um, and he's bringing his military advisors with him. The result will be a full-fledged conference, the so-called Arcadia Conference, um, in which the machinery for Allied coordination is established with the aim of not repeating the errors of World War I. So you get unity of command. One commander from one nation in each theater for the Army, Navy, and Air Forces of both countries. You also get the creation of the Combined Chiefs of Staff, which is composed of the U.S. and British Air Chiefs, Naval Chiefs, and Ground Chiefs. They are to meet in continuous session. They do so in person whenever Roosevelt and Churchill meet. And then they do so in Washington when the British send delegates to represent them in meetings with the Americans. But which Americans? There is no organization of American Army, Navy, and Air Chiefs. One has to be created to match the British. And the British group is known as the Chiefs of Staff Organization. Uh, the American group becomes known as the Joint Chiefs of Staff. This is how the Joint Chiefs of Staff start. They have no charter until 1947. They exist simply by presidential directive, allowing them to exist. When Marshall asks for a charter, Roosevelt says, why? Uh, that is the FDR way of operating. You also see the fact that, um, well, let me hold that, Arnold, okay? The Combined Chiefs report directly to Roosevelt and Churchill. A few months after this, in March of 1942, Marshall totally reorganizes the War Department, which, as the quip went, contained so much dead wood that it had become a fire hazard. Uh, instead, there ought to be three autonomous super commands reporting directly to Marshall. Services of supply, 
Army ground forces, and Army air forces under Arnold. Okay? Again, as Deso pointed out, Arnold Marshall is a strong proponent of air power. It is Marshall who will appoint Arnold to head the uh, American Air Forces, the movement, excuse me, the Army Air Forces, the movement from the Army Air Corps to the Army Air Forces, and he supports Arnold. He even has Arnold placed on the Joint Chiefs and the Combined Chiefs, even though technically Arnold is his subordinate. Now these moves do not eliminate allied or inter-service disagreement. That's not possible, as Connor noted in his War College lecture. But they provide organizational structures in which the disagreements can be thrashed out and resolved. The largest of these disagreements is over not whether to defeat Germany first, but how to defeat Germany first. That argument between the British indirect and the American direct approach is not settled until late 1943 at the first Big Three meeting with Stalin in Tehran. Now both Brad Coleman and Nigel Hamilton have analyzed this dispute for you in their lectures. So I'm not going to. Okay? The problem is I've written an entire book on it. And if I start going into it, you will never get out of here. But it is basically this British peripheral approach focusing on the Mediterranean versus the American direct approach across the channel during the question and answer period. I'll be happy to go into it as deeply as you want. I would remind you, though, of one point that both Brad Coleman and Nigel Hamilton made. The importance of the Soviet war effort, which we tend to downplay, the statistics are staggering. The Americans suffered 209, approximately 294,000 combat dead during World War II. Uh, the Soviets suffered at least that many at the single battle of Stalingrad. Uh, the combined British and American civilian and military death toll is approximately 850, 880,000. The Soviet death toll is about 25 million. Um, and the bulk of German combat deaths take place on the Eastern Front, not the Western Front. Uh, uh, people's, you know, it is not the United States that won the war. And I would say it's not the Soviet Union or Britain that won the war. It was the combination of the three and the unified strategy that they came up with. But in terms of manpower and bleeding the German army, you, you, you couldn't do it without the Russians. Let me also expand a bit on Nigel's major reassessment of Roosevelt as commander in chief. He has produced two out of three planned volumes on Roosevelt as Commander-in-Chief, and his aim is to demolish the myth of Roosevelt as a passive Commander-in-Chief with the Joint Chiefs running the show during World War II. Now, I agree totally, but I was not the first to say this. Nigel was not the first to say this. William Emerson of the Franklin Roosevelt Library said it in 1959. Kent Roberts Greenfield the head of uh, the Army Green series said it in 1963. But Nigel's will be the lengthiest and most detailed attempt to put Roosevelt at the center of everything. Nigel sees Roosevelt directing 1942 strategy against Marshall. They, he doesn't believe with Marshall that the channel could be successfully crossed in 1942. He wants North Africa instead for political reasons. But Roosevelt then shifts in 1943 and does support Marshall's strategy against Churchill. But my, Nigel insists that all of this is Roosevelt's grand strategy, that Roosevelt is the master commander in chief. Again, I'd be happy to go into the extent to which I agree or disagree with this during the Q&A. And I was fascinated by Nigel's comment that uh, Roosevelt was using Marshall as, quote, a chess piece in this fight with the prime minister. Uh, and questions over who would command the overlord invasion. There were also disagreements within the Joint Chiefs and planning committees over Europe versus the Far East. 
And let me point out to you that despite Europe first, there were more American forces in the Pacific than in Europe throughout all of 1942 and most of 1943, despite the Germany first. There is also debate over which route in the Pacific to take and relations with Douglas MacArthur, who as Jim Zobel uh, exuberantly pointed out <laughs> in his presentation, um, the relations with MacArthur were far from as bitter as is usually poor trade. MacArthur, when he was chief of staff, did not try to cripple Marshall's career by sending him to Chicago to train the Illinois National Guard in 1935. Jim went into this. MacArthur had recommended Marshall for promotion to Brigadier General. And I think you must understand the importance of the Chicago assignment in light of the bonus march a few years earlier. MacArthur fully expected an insurrection. And Chicago was a likely place for it to take place during the Great Depression. So the training of the Illinois National Guard was quite important. Now MacArthur did feel betrayed by Roosevelt and Marshall over his quote abandonment in the Philippines in early 1942. And M MacArthur opposed the Europe first strategy throughout the war. In doing so, he had what Marshall referred to as localitis, thinking that his theater was the most important. Jim also pointed out that MacArthur never realized that Marshall was his greatest ally in Washington. It was Marshall who recommended MacArthur for the Medal of Honor. It was Marshall who convinced Roosevelt to withdraw MacArthur from the Philippines to head the Southwest Pacific area from Australia. Now, but that in turn led to conflicts with the Chief of Naval op Operations, Admiral King, who wanted to shut down the Southwest Pacific and focus all attention on Admiral Nimitz's drive across the Central Pacific. And King's point of view, as, as Jim pointed out, was, look, I give you, George, what you want in Europe. That's your theater. The Pacific is mine, so what in the world are you doing with MacArthur? This conflict only compounded other problems Marshall had with King, a very prickly and difficult man. Rumor had it that he shaved with a blowtorch. <laughs> His daughter, I love this, said, no, he is the most even-tempered man in the world. He is always in a rage. <laughs> Uh, not an easy person to get along with. Marshall insisted on inter-service cooperation, and there are famous stories of, of Marshall saying, look, we have got to, King stalked out of Marshall's waiting room once because he was being kept waiting for an appointment. What he didn't know was that the Australian foreign minister was in Marshall's office and wouldn't leave. That is why it was late. Marshall went right over to King's office Forrest Pogue tells this story and said, we have got to get along. Um, Marshall also pressed Roosevelt for the appointment of a chairman to the Joint Chiefs of Staff to represent the chiefs to him. Uh, the British had such a person uh, in General Ismay. Uh, Roosevelt's answer was fascinating. He said, I have a chief of staff. You're my chief of staff. And Marshall said, no, I'm your army chief of staff. You need a chief of army, navy, and air. Roosevelt's answer, that's my job. <laughs> I love that, that answer. And when he finally agreed to appoint uh, w w someone who would become chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral William D. Leahy, he described him as my leg man to the chiefs whereas Marshall had wanted Leahy to be the Joint Chiefs leg man to the president. Again, uh, Nigel knows about this. You, you, you see Roosevelt wanting to be the controlling uh, strategist in this war. Marshall was also involved in the continued expansion of the army, which now grew um, up to eight million, over eight million. <laughs> 
Uh, these had to be trained and organized in the United States and then shipped overseas. As Stephen Taffy pointed out to you, these men were to be organized in 89 divisions of about 15,000 men. Now, if you do your arithmetic, you say, wait a minute, 15,000, even if you round it to 90 and 100, is nowhere near 8 million. Um, well, you do subtract the air forces, but still, what you have is what's known as the division slice. The support troops necessary to support a division overseas. And you're projecting power thousands of miles out. So that division slice is very, very large. The gamble relied upon Soviet power that you only needed 89 divisions. It is known as the 90 division gamble. And it worked, barely. In the Battle of, of the Bulge, if uh, the Germans had succeeded further, there were no reserves left to be called up. Um, Taffy also pointed out to you how Marshall appointed his commanders. Uh, his interest, again, in character, military education, youth, and his knowledge of you, either personally or through someone who knows you. He continued to rely on Benning men, but also the recommendations from Benning men and from those with whom he had worked closely during World War I, as well as those in the field. Marshall, as I previously noted, was a strong supporter of air power, but he did not believe that strategic bombing could win the war, as the air power adv advocates claimed. Again and again, he said, it comes down to that little guy in the mud. And in this, as Con Crane pointed out in that session, of which I was a part, on myths of World War II, this strategic bombing myth that you could simply bomb and the enemy would be forced to give up. Um, it just did not work. And the strategic bombing campaign was a failure until you developed a fighter aircraft capable of accompanying the bombers all the way to Germany and tactically able to um, de defeat the German fighters. We're talking, of course, about the P-51 Mustang uh, in doing this. At which point the aim changed. It was no longer destroy German factories, destroy German will to resist. It was destroy the Luftwaffe. Uh, as one uh, Air Force pilot put it to me, World War II veteran, he said, I asked, Did, were you aware of this shift? And he said, oh yeah, we became the bait. We were the bait to bring the German Air Force up. Now, by mid-1943, Marshall was, in effect, running and coordinating the entire U.S. global war effort. And in early 1944, time made him its man of the year, calling him Civis Americanus, the epitome of the American servant soldier. It's an extraordinary tribute to him that I don't have time to go into now. It's for that very reason that he was denied the Overlord Command. It's a long story. Again, I'd be happy to go into it in the Q&A period. Nigel went into it uh, of everyone assuming uh, Marshall would get the position, but the other members of the Joint Chiefs, Pershing and others, saying, you can't spare him from Washington. So in the end, Roosevelt asks Marshall, do you want the command? And Marshall says, I, uh, I refuse to answer. You have to do what's best for the country, not what is best for George Marshall. At which point Roosevelt said, then it shall be Eisenhower. I could not sleep without you out of the country. When the war ended, Marshall was deeply involved in post-war planning, and he pushed for UMT in his final published report and failed to get it. It's when, and he keeps trying from 1945 until 1951 and fails. He never gets it. So what can we conclude from this? Marshall's Nobel speech, which was not his best, he was quite ill at that point. But he did go into why a soldier receiving a peace prize did not seem, quote, as remarkable to me as apparently it does 
to others. And he then, uh, the famous uh, lines uh, from that uh, um, Nobel um, speech, let me just quote it to you for a minute. I know a great deal of the horrors and tragedies of war. Today, as chairman of the American Battle Monuments Commission, it is my duty to supervise the construction and maintenance of military cemeteries in many countries overseas. The cost of war in human lives is constantly spread before me, written neatly in many ledgers whose columns are gravestones. I am deeply moved to find some means or method of avoiding another calamity of war. Almost daily, I hear from the wives or mothers of families of the fallen. The tragedy of the aftermath is almost constantly before me. As this lecture has hopefully pointed out to you, Marshall saw military unpreparedness as a cause of war and preparedness as a way to prevent war. His preferred, in fact, what he said is the only method for a democratic society was UMT. But for all his efforts, he could not get it. Let me conclude with the concluding line from Marshall's Nobel um, speech. Quote, I hope I have sown some seeds which may bring forth good fruit. Thank you very much. Okay, my apologies. This thing was supposed to end maybe five or ten minutes ago, and uh, I, I, I rehearse it, but then, what, pardon? Keep talking. <laughs> I rehearse it, but, but, and it fits, and then when I deliver it, it takes longer. I cannot figure that, that one out. But it is open to your questions. I'm happy to try to answer any question that you have. Yes, ma'am. Uh, did Marshall uh, have a lot of input into the Marshall Plan, or was it George Kennan, or uh, even though his name's on it, I read a couple of places. Yep. Am I right or wrong? You are right. Am you are, right? You are um, question, did Marshall have a lot of input into the Marshall Plan? Or was it people like George Kennan who really came up with it? Marshall told Forrest Pogue in the interviews that his great contribution was not the idea. He said, that's simple. Um, it was not simple, but uh, selling it to the American people. That was my contribution to it. Please keep in mind, you had an accidental Democratic president, Harry Truman, and a Republican Congress, okay? And you are going to have to convince them to, produce, to agree to what still ranks today as percentage of GNP as the largest foreign aid program in American history. Uh, and he did it. He became very close friends with the Republican leader of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Arthur Vandenberg, who had been an isolationist before World War II and worked with Marshall. His comment again in the interviews, Vandenberg and I could not have been much closer unless he sat in my lap or I sat in his. And they became very close friends as a result of this. Um, and he put it over and it is the most brilliant success, I would argue, in the entire history of American foreign policy. But he never claimed credit for the idea. Uh, Kennan worked on it, Charles Bolin worked on it, Walter Lippmann was talking about it. And he, in fact, people, they call his Harvard speech the Marshall Plan speech. It's not. There's no plan. What he says is he, it, he encourages the Europeans to meet and come up with a coordinated plan and then meet with the Americans who will provide the aid to make the plan work. Okay? I would have loved to have gone into the Marshall Plan, but that is your next topic for these lectures. Uh, and I was told, stop at the end of World, World War II. But she, she started me on it, Rob. It's not, it's not my fault. Okay, other questions?
Yes, sir. How are you? I've heard, yeah, I saw you. In 1942, does he truly believe, if he got his way, that the Allies could launch a cross-channel invasion? Or is he just positioned? Did you all hear that? No. Did Marshall truly believe that you could cross the channel in 1942, or is he, quote, merely positioning? Um, Eisenhower, who really came up with the plan, it's called the Marshall Plan, not plan, excuse me, the Marshall Memorandum, but it's Eisenhower, who as head of the Operations Division, actually writes it. Uh, great irony there, as you can see. Uh, and there are three parts to the plan. You have the buildup of U.S. forces in the U.K., codenamed Bolero. For a 19, massive 1943 invasion, 48 divisions, that is codenamed Roundup. And an emergency operation, if necessary, in the fall of 1942, with whatever divisions are then available, probably five to ten, codenamed Sledgehammer. What's the emergency? Either Germany is on the verge of collapse or the Soviet Union is on the verge of collapse. Um, did he believe, and the Americans as the Soviet Union is, seems to be on the verge of collapse. The Americans press for s Sledgehammer. Um, did Marshall believe it could work? Eisenhower said the chances of success were only one in five. Uh, but it was worth the try to divert forces, German forces, from the Eastern Front. The British said you will not divert a single German soldier from the Eastern Front. You will simply have another bloodbath. Uh, we cannot support this operation and reinforce it into 1943. What people tend to forget is that the main military concept here was concentration of force. It was the buildup of forces in the United Kingdom that was key to Marshall so that you would have options. And he feared that if you didn't get this plan, there would be no buildup of American forces in the United Kingdom, which is exactly what happened. When Roosevelt said, no, we're going to do North Africa because the British will not agree to cross the channel, that was the end of the American buildup. Uh, the major, uh, of course, you had the U.S. Air Forces, but the major buildup of U.S. ground forces only occurs in 1944, after you have decided you will cross the channel, and that's when you finally get more U.S. forces in the European theater than in the Far East. So, to what extent did Marshall believe you could successfully cross the channel? He never said. He never said, you can reach your own conclusions on this. He did join with Admiral King when the British refused to cross the channel in saying, we should then go for a Pacific first strategy. Now, Roosevelt rejected it out of hand, signed it commander in chief, uh, and told Marshall that he knew exactly what this was, uh, that it was a ruse um, a, a bluff to, to get the British to agree out of fear to cross the channel. Uh, he, uh, Roosevelt told Stimson, this is like taking up your dishes and going home, uh, and he would not tolerate it. Uh, uh, I think that there was reality behind it. Um, it's something we will never know the answer to, but um, the belief was that going all out against Japan would aid the Soviet Union more than invading French North Africa. That by doing that, you remove the possibility of the Japanese attacking the Soviet rear. That was the logic behind it. The truth, we will never know. How yes, did who? the DF raid, invasion, whatever you want to call it, come into play in this battle of crossing the channel, not crossing the how did the Dieppe raid, the Canadian catastrophe, um, which took place after the decisions had been reached, um, it, it didn't directly affect it, but in its aftermath, it reinforced the British point that the Germans are prepared, we cannot cross the channel now. And it also made clear that you, when you did cross the channel, it should not be against 
um, a fortified city, um, an established port, that instead you would go on an open beach and create your own harbor, Normandy. Uh, that's, Jep has that sort of an influence. There is a conspiracy theory that uh, the British allowed this catastrophe to take place in order to be able to say to the Americans, you are wrong. Um, I don't believe in conspiracy theories in general. Um, my wife, uh, whenever she hears one, says, my husband doesn't believe in conspiracy theories. As, as an historian, he thinks human beings are too stupid to pull them off. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, but there, there, there is, it is the only, only a British operation on which the combined, on which the British Chiefs of Staff did not sign off. And a lot of this has to do with Churchill's insistence on putting Mountbatten on the combined Chiefs of Staff, which the rest of the Chiefs did not like. This was Mountbatten's baby. Uh, and. Uh, there's a, there's a book, uh, if you're interested, by the historian Brian Villa called Unauthorized Action, which takes up this. Uh, but I, I, I think the, cons the major consequence of GIEP, it, it did reinforce the British position, we're not ready to do this, but the decision to land at Normandy, not to try to take a port, given what the Canadians faced. Hope that answers. Uh, your question. I cannot believe that I was so clear that there are not more. Hello, John, how are you? Yeah. On the issue of the presidency versus the, the, the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. Yep. Ultimately, the, the, chair, the president is in command, is he not? He can fire the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. The Chief of Staff can't fire him. R okay. The position of the Joint Chiefs of, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, it was not called that during the war. It was called Chief of Staff to the Commander-in-Chief. And it's only really in 1947 that it becomes Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And the power of the Chairman evolves gradually. But um, of course, the President can always relieve uh, anybody on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, uh, Give me a minute here. I just lost my train of thought, which is happening more and more as I age. Uh, the president can, of course, get rid of the chairman. Um, but Marshall's point was to have somebody who could go before Roosevelt and say, this is what the chiefs believe. This is what they think should happen. What Roosevelt wanted was someone who would represent his point of view in meetings of the Joint Chiefs and having read the minutes of the Joint Chiefs during the war, Leahy, Ad Admiral Leahy does exactly that again and again. When the Chiefs begin to deal with matters that have political overtones, matters of grand strategy, Leahy will say, this is none of our business. This belongs to the president. Uh, he was the president's man. Uh, it's, I find it fascinating, and as I said, I agree with Nigel to the extent that Roosevelt is a very active and controlling commander in chief. I think he may be the most politically brilliant um, president this country has ever produced, but to figure him out uh, when I do research at Hyde Park, I can hear him laughing. Uh, you know, and I love the comment of um, uh, one, his, one biographer, Je Jeffrey Ward, who after he finished writing the biography, related a recurring and maddening dream of playing cards with Franklin Roosevelt, okay? <laughs> Roosevelt's talking nonstop, nonstop, but while he's talking, he's taking cards from the deck and putting them up his sleeve. This is in the dream. And Ward's conclusion, I think it's safe to say that all of Franklin Roosevelt's cards were never on the table. I agree totally with that. Anything else?
You would all rather go to the reception than hear me anymore. Fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.